Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to Renewal Church. Uh, thank you for tuning in on this Sunday morning to worship with us, uh, especially if this is your first time uh, checking us out, uh, visiting. Uh, we really pray uh, that God's blessing uh, would reach your hearts uh, through our worship service today. Well, this week has been another turbulent week in our lives in this city, and I'm sure many of us find ourselves uh, exhausted, uh, weary, and discouraged this morning, and realizing how much we need comfort and rest uh, from a mighty God. And so we turn to this God, uh, receiving his call to worship as we begin our service today, realizing that in Christianity, uh, this God that we come before is not a distant deity who oversees us from afar, but is a personal, loving, merciful Savior, a shepherd. And that's what Psalm 23 is all about. And this is the passage uh, we're going to look at for our call to worship. So let's read this responsibly together, remembering that we don't worship a God on Sundays of our own making. Uh, but one who has revealed, who has been revealed to us. So let's read this responsively. I'll read the top section uh, marked minister. Please join me uh, in reading the bottom section marked all. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our great God, indeed the words that we have just prayed come straight from your word to us, revealing to us that you are a God who cares, that you are an ever-present help, a shepherd who laid down his life as you came as a man in Jesus Christ by dying on a cross for us so that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt in our hearts and minds that you are guiding us every step of this rocky journey we're on in this world. That even though there are dark days where it feels like the valley of the shadow of death, even there you will comfort us. You will guide us to places of rest and stillness because of you and not because of anything we do. So even in this worship service today, God, be our hope, peace, confidence, and strength. Increase our faith as we come before a holy God. Be glorified in our midst. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's join our hearts in worship together.
Well, I love those lines that we just sang. What other beauty demands such praises? What other majesty rules with justice? It's God and God alone. All glory be to his name. And so we want to take a minute now in our service to confess our faith uh, by uh, speaking of what we believe. The Apostles' Creed is an ancient confession that's been passed down through the ages that's a clear summary of the core beliefs of Christianity. And so it's good for us uh, as Christians from time to time, our faith wavers. Uh, we forget what we should base our hopes on uh, to confess in front of one another out loud uh, what it is that we're, we're about uh, in our faith. And if you're not a believer here today, wanting to learn more about uh, Christianity and our beliefs, this is the best place to come. And we pray that one day soon uh, that these beliefs can become yours as well. So Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, friends, because we believe these words to be true, we believe that one day we'll live forever. Uh, in his presence in heaven one day. So with that confidence, let's now join our hearts and pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray, surrendering our will to him. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue in worshiping our God. I will kneel in the dust at the foot of the cross with mercy.
Father, we thank you for being a holy God. We thank you for being a God who displays his majesty um, by being just. And so, Lord, we look to you. Help us to make this song our prayer. Help us to constantly kneel before you at your feet. being reminded of your amazing mercy, a mercy that is endless as the sea. And help us to not only just be reminded of your mercy, but help us to be agents of your mercy, to be agents of justice. Help us to be able to proclaim the words of this song that we would never lose the wonder of your mercy and that we would sing hallelujah forever and so we thank you we love you and we pray all these things in your name amen welcome again happy november and especially if you're uh, joining us for the first time uh we're so glad that you can tune in uh we love to get to know you Uh, we love for you to get to know us, and um, the best we can do uh, during these very restricted times is to point you to our website uh, on the I'm New section of our page. Uh, the link's there right below if you click on that. Um, you'll uh, be forwarded to our site where you can learn more about us. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. You'll see our social media platforms. You can sign up for our email database, uh, and even join a community group uh, where you can connect with and, um, and meet other brothers and sisters, members of our church. So please do that and hopefully one day we'll be able to uh, greet you and meet you in person. Also, we uh, are continuing to have our chat feature uh, on during 
uh, our virtual services, uh, a way for us to interact. You can uh, leave a comment, you can say hello, uh, leave an emoji, just let us know that uh, you're there. Um, it, uh, we'd very much appreciate that. If you have any questions, uh, we do have a pastor who's manning this and uh, can respond right away. We we'll have a couple announcements uh, to highlight. Uh, first is a very important announcement. Uh, we had originally planned uh, to have two outdoor communion services uh, today. Uh, we're very excited about it, but unfortunately, uh, due to the recent spike in positive COVID cases here in our city and our city's health commissioner, Dr. Farley, strongly discouraging us uh, from gathering uh, in any kind of social setting, um, you know, we've come to the decision to cancel uh, those services for today. And secondly, um, last week we had our virtual city conference. Uh, and so the, um, the videos, the YouTube videos for those uh, messages and the seminar are posted on our page. So if you missed it, if you'd like to go back and listen to it again, um, feel free to uh, follow uh, the link and uh, you'll be directed to our YouTube page. Uh, so uh, feel free to do that. Uh, and also in response to that, if you uh, feel compelled uh, to serve our city in any way uh, on our website, the links there uh, on our Serve the City uh, tab, um, you'll find our partnering organizations and ways you can safely volunteer during this time. Uh, so please do that if you're led to do so. Well, normally during this time in our service, uh, we collect offering. And so um, this is just our weekly reminder uh, to continue to faithfully give. Uh, the giving link is on uh, our, uh, the box below. You can go to our website uh, for all members, attenders, uh, as we've been challenged in recent weeks. Everything we have uh, is a gift from God. And this is just an expression. Uh, even though God doesn't need uh, our, our money, he doesn't need to deduct anything from our ba bank accounts. Uh, this is just a way for us uh, to show our dependence on God, our gratitude, and it's a form of our surrender and worship. Uh, so let's continue to do that. If you're not a Christian and if you're uh, a newcomer, um, no, no obligation to give. Uh, this is just the, what we do as Christians, uh, to living in faithful obedience and surrender to our God. Well, now we'll have our time of uh, intercessory prayer. And uh, there's a lot of important things to pray for. So we decided today to pray for uh, two topics. And the first topic that we're going to lift up uh, today uh, is uh, prayers for uh, the family of Walter Wallace Jr., uh, unfortunately, uh, this past Monday afternoon, uh, Walter Wallace Jr., a uh, young uh, black gentleman um, who lives right here in West Philadelphia, was uh, shot and killed by a couple of police officers, uh, which led to um, a lot of unrest uh, and just a lot of, um, a lot of chaos uh, and a lot of hurt and pain uh, in uh, our community. And so what can we do as Christians uh, but to turn to the one uh, who brings healing, uh, to the one who calls us uh, to stand next to our hurting brothers and sisters, to weep, lament, mourn with them. And so let's pray. Uh, let's pray for uh, these topics. Uh, pray for the family of Walter Wallace uh, as they grieve. Uh, pray for God's comfort over them. Uh, let's pray for our city uh, in the way they continue to respond uh, with uh, resolution that we can um, learn from this uh, by... Um, uh, really just improving our mental health services and for God's peace to spread. And let's pray for all the minority-owned small businesses in our neighborhood that were looted um, and, and vandalized, uh, that they can recover soon. Uh, so uh, let's spend a minute here and I'll lift up these prayer topics to the Lord. Secondly, uh, another very important prayer topic is for uh, this coming week's presidential election. I know that for a lot of us, this has been a source of anxiety uh, as we think about both the process 
of the election as well as the result. And so as people of God who really uh, believe that our lives, our well-being is in his hands and not in the hands of any human being who takes a human office, but ultimately in the one uh, who holds our destinies and who holds this world and all that happens together by the authority of his word, let's come to him in faith, uh, lifting up these very, very important topics as so much is at stake. Uh, let's trust in the Lord uh, that he would be in charge and in control. So here are the prayer topics uh, for the election. Let's pray that the process uh, will be secure, safe, uh, that it will be unhindered by any foul play, uh, that it will be have an honest outcome. Let's pray for our leaders who are running the election, that they will be guided by God's wisdom uh, and endurance and honesty. And let's pray uh, that most importantly, uh, that regardless of who wins, regardless of what the outcome is, that there would be, uh, by God's grace, a peaceful transition in leadership. And that our nation as a whole, uh, that as God allows, we would be moving towards unity and healing uh, rather than continuing down uh, the road of brokenness and fracture. And friends, we need God's help for this. Uh, so let's join our hearts and pray together. Father, we come before you this day uh, really believing that you hear our prayers. Uh, you hear the prayers of the oppressed. You hear the cries for mercy, deliverance, and justice. Uh, you do not turn a deaf ear. Uh, Lord, you yourself came to this earth to understand the brokenness and the pain. And God, we come believing that even today, uh, Lord, that this is the God that you are. And so we pray now uh, on behalf of uh, Walter Wallace, uh, his family, uh, as they are uh, still in intense pain and, and uh, grieving uh, the loss uh, of their brother. We pray uh, that your presence will be there by their side, as well as the rest of the community, uh, that they would trust in the Lord, uh, their God. Uh, you would bring the peace that only Christ can bring, uh, the peace that you shed your blood uh, to give to those who would trust in you. And so make yourself known uh, during this time of pain uh, and grieving. We pray that our city would come to really learn from uh uh, Lord, this uh, sad but all too familiar uh, lessons we're learning, uh, God, about uh, how to respond in these crisis situations, Lord. Uh, pray that it will become safer, uh, that mental health services uh, would be uh, used in a better way, uh, and that um, uh, just uh, very tragic situations like this will be further avoided. And we pray for any of the uh, minority-owned small businesses in West Philly that uh, they would somehow, um, Lord, you would uh, provide for them, that they could recover and be back on their feet soon. We, Lord, we pray for this upcoming election uh, this week. Uh, Lord, our hearts are heavy as we think about what could possibly happen, Father, um, as far as uh, the results and uh, how, how the nation responds uh, and the possibility, God, of further fracture, uh, tension, uh, hatred deepening. Lord, we cry out for mercy. We pray that you would watch over all of us, God, uh, that, Lord, the process uh, of, of counting the ballots and all these things will be in your hands, uh, that uh, the result is in your hands. And even as Christians, the way we respond, it will be honoring to you, uh, Lord, and that uh, by your grace, uh, there will be a peaceful transition of power, God. Um, and whatever happens, Lord, uh, we uh, look to you, God, to guide us, Lord. Um, and uh, we ask that uh, in the midst of everything, Lord, this will be an opportunity, uh, Lord, for uh, your people to rise in faith, uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ to shine forth in clearer ways and bring hope, uh, salvation, uh, and, and joy and life to many. And so we lift up these things to you, uh, uh, believing that uh, you hear our prayers uh, and you act in your wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we hear the word of God, uh, we'll have our scripture reading. Uh, we read by our sister, one of the deaconesses of our church, Sister Uriah Min. Hi. My name is Uria, and I am one of the deaconesses at our church. The scripture reading for today comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. 
Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God, who can make straight what he has made crooked. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, greetings, Renewal family, and to all who are virtually visiting us this morning. Before we get to today's text uh, and our message for today, I wanted to actually begin by sharing a brief pastoral comment and really issuing a call to our church. This past Friday, I was uh, on a Zoom with several ministry leaders and pastors, and we were just sharing our heart and our thoughts uh, about the Walter Wallace Jr. Uh, shooting. And uh, in the course of that time, one of the brothers shared this quote from N.T. Wright. It says, The Christian vocation is to be in prayer, in the spirit, at the place where the world is in pain. And as we embrace that vocation, we discover it to be the way of following Christ, shaped according to his messianic vocation to the cross, with arms outstretched, holding on simultaneously to the pain of the world and to the love of God. In light of all that has been happening in our city and our nation, church, our call is to be a people of prayer. And certainly, a significant change in the world happens and involves uh, much more than just prayer. Uh, we are called to act. But significant change in the world cannot happen apart from prayer. As we continue, to face various struggles, the ongoing COVID crisis, the struggle uh, for a more just society, the struggle of deep divisions, polarization, and hostility along ethnic and political lines. Church, we must recognize that as the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You see, the problems we are facing aren't merely or, or solely psychological, sociological, physical. They are deeply, deeply spiritual in nature. In the midst of our grief, in the midst of our exhaustion, in the midst of our feelings of helplessness and powerlessness, in the midst of our confusion. Brothers and sisters, we must run to the throne of grace because you see, Jesus meets us and Jesus grieves with us. That he shares with us in our sorrow and our grief. However, here's what he does not share with us. He is not exhausted like us. He is not helpless like us. He is not powerless. He is not confused. No, to him belongs all power, all authority, all wisdom are his. And so church, I'm calling us as the church to unite our hearts and our voices in prayer. I'm asking that for the course of this month, the entire month of November, that we as a church commit to consistent, focused prayer for our communities, for our city, 
for our nation and even the ends of the earth. I'm encouraging us to consider fasting, which is to forego typically food, but it doesn't have to be limited to food, but to forego, forego something as an expression of our visceral longing, our deep, deep desperation for, for Jesus' power and Jesus' presence to be manifested in our lives and in our world. And we'd like to help you as we call you to prayer. We want to help you to pray by offering a few practical aids in that. First, in the notes below, you're going to find a prayer guide that's designed um, for seven days of the week uh, to have different prayer topics each day. And so you can follow that prayer guide. You can pray it along with your family, perhaps. Uh, but each day, there's going to be a few bullet points to guide you in how you can specifically be praying uh, with us uh, together for, again, our city, nation, and world. In addition, every Wednesday in November, um, and minus the fourth Wednesday, which is that Thanksgiving week, but the first three Wednesdays in November, we will host a Zoom prayer time at noon. So whether you're working from home, whether you are going into an office of sorts, consider this. Consider fasting that lunch hour. Oh, it's 30-minute meeting, but consider fasting that time period and then joining our, our Zoom prayer time. Coming on to join your brothers and sisters uh, in your church family that we would lift our voices together in prayer. One final idea I'd like to offer Perhaps what would, again, normally be a meal time for you. Um, it doesn't have to be dinner time, but let's just say it's dinner time. That you would, instead of eating that evening, fast that meal and do a prayer walk around your community. Again, you can perhaps do this as an individual or with your family or perhaps someone you've already been quarantined with. But just simply walk the streets of your neighborhood praying for the flourishing, the shalom, the well-being of your neighborhood, praying specifically for your neighbors who are probably feeling the very same things that you are and yet may not have a place to turn to find comfort, to find peace, to find hope. And so be praying for them and that, of course, ultimately, that they would one day find that hope in Christ find those things in Christ. So church, may we be faithful to our call, to our vocation, to be a people who are praying in the Spirit, as Wright says, at the places where the world is in pain, arms outstretched, holding on simultaneously to the pain of the world and to the love of God. And so would you bow with me even now in a word of prayer as we uh, commit to this as a church? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in these heartbreaking and frustrating and troubled times, we turn to you now in prayer. We come not based on our own merits or because we're worthy to be heard. We come in the name of Christ on whose merit we are heard. And Lord, at this time, as a church, Lord, we want to commit to calling upon you because we see the need to pray and we are reminded and, and we recognize your call for us to be a praying people. For it is through our prayers that you have sovereignly ordained that you would actually move in this world. And so, Lord, as our heart's desire for so many of us, we want to help in some way and we want to do something. And, and certainly we want to continue to explore what we can practically do and how to move our feet. But Lord, do remind us that one of the greatest ways that we can serve our neighbors, serve our communities, serve our country is through prayer through praying for them, on behalf of them. 
and asking that your kingdom power would break through in mighty ways, bringing about the change, the healing, the restoration, the justice that only ultimately you can. And so we thank you for who you are. And even now, as we turn to your word with you further, would you further instruct us in your word to know how to respond rightly in times like this? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, if you've been with us, uh, we have been studying the book of Ecclesiastes together. And in our passage today, chapter 7, the preacher takes a bit of a stylistic turn. And he begins to employ a series of proverbs. And this is probably uh, what comes to mind when we think about wisdom literature in the Bible. That's probably what we have in mind, this style. Uh, In fact, that's what the book of Proverbs is, right? It's a collection of Proverbs. Now, at the end of chapter 6, the preacher has just posed this question in verse 12. For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? In other words, he's asking, since life is short, and life is full of vanity and frustration. How can we live life well? How can we make the most of life? And he begins to answer that question in chapter 7 through this series of Proverbs. Now, if you look at these Proverbs, at first glance, they seem a little haphazard. They seem a little disconnected and random, but there actually is a unifying theme. And and that unifying theme or the overarching point that he is making is this. In order to live well under the sun, in order to live well under the sun, you must have wisdom. You must have wisdom. Yes, life is brief. Yes, it's filled with frustration and vanity and it's difficult. But you will make it even worse for yourself if you lack wisdom. Or, on the other hand, if you live in folly rather than wisdom. And so what he's doing here in our passage today is describing what wisdom looks like. Wisdom's ways and wisdom's benefits. For example, in verse 1, he says, A good name is better than precious ointment. He's making the point that your reputation, a good name, your reputation is better than material wealth, which he's referring to when he says precious ointment. Precious ointment was expensive, costly, valuable. But he's saying a good name or reputation is much more valuable than just material stuff. Or on the other side of the coin, folly, foolishness, is to live your life more concerned about the amount of cash and credit you have rather than the quality of your character. That's foolishness. As we've seen in Ecclesiastes, poor character, poor character will invite a wealth of trouble. Poor character invites a wealth of trouble into your life. But there are three particular aspects of wise living that the preacher focuses on, and I will describe them under these three headings, and this is what we'll look at. Wisdom welcomes. Secondly, wisdom waits. And third, wisdom watches over. And once again, in the providence of God, I think the lessons here in this text are very, very timely, given our present experience. So, first of all, wisdom welcomes. And more specifically, here's what I'm getting at. Here's what the text is getting at. Wisdom welcomes sorrow and discomfort. Wisdom welcomes sorrow and discomfort. Look at verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to, the go, than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, 
and the living will lay it to heart. House of mourning is a funeral. Think about this. Funerals lend themselves to contemplating our lives deeply and seriously. The reality that our days are numbered, that our lives are not guaranteed, they tend to remind us of what really matters in life. In contrast, things like birthday parties or other kinds of celebrations, celebratory types type of events, they are less likely to lead you to think deeply and meaningfully about your life and how you're living it. He continues in verses 3 and 4 along the same line of thought. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You see, it's not that the life of faith is meant to be this life of joylessness where we walk around in a somber mood and frowning all the time. Jesus himself, uh, during his time on earth, went to plenty of parties and celebrations and he laughed and he got criticized for that. But the emphasis here is on the fact that it's the sad, it's the difficult, even the heartbreaking things in life that are often far more instructive, far more valuable in teaching us what we should value, how we should be living, what truly matters in this life. And this is what he means when he says, by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. It's not that we're glad or should be glad about the brokenness itself, but rather as we face the brokenness and as we contemplate the deeper truths about life and our lives, our heart is made glad because we begin to turn away from hoping in and desiring things that are fleeting and that are frivolous. And we turn instead to that which is more substantial and more satisfying. He continues in verses 5 and 6. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This also is vanity. You see, typically, we don't like to hear about our faults, our weaknesses. If anything, our culture is moving more and more towards being very easily, too easily offended where if anything negative is said or begins to make us uncomfortable, our temptation, and certainly the culture around us more and more, you're seeing this, we cancel each other out. We shut each other down. And so it's hard to even have any kind of genuine dialogue with someone because the moment they start to feel uncomfortable or hurt, their feelings are hurt, you get canceled. But wisdom, wisdom would rather be made uncomfortable and hear the truth. Wisdom would rather be uncomfortable so they can hear the truth. He uses the imagery of a pot over crackling thorns. If you've ever been camping, you'll know, and if you've ever tried to, uh, been camping and tried to start a fire, you will know that you can't just grab a log and try to light it on fire. It's never going to work. You need to start with kindling, right? Small, those small, little, tiny, thin, knotty branches. And that's what he has in mind when he's talking about thorns under a pot. He's talking about kindling. But here's the thing about kindling. Once you light the kindling, you can't just depend on the kindling to keep you warm for the rest of the night. It won't, because even though it burns 
fast, it burns quickly, it doesn't burn long because it has no substance to it. And this is why you use the kindling to light the logs on fire and the logs will burn long because they have weight, they have substance. By itself, kindling can never keep you warm for the rest of the night. Likewise, he's saying laughter makes a lot of noise, like the crackling of kindling, and it'll make you feel better for a moment, right? It provides a little bit of warmth, but it lacks weight, it lacks substance, and it will not keep you warm through the long, bitterly cold, dark seasons of life. For this reason, you see, wisdom welcomes sorrow and discomfort. The fool lives an unexamined life. They are superficial, they are shallow, and when hardship comes, when discomfort comes, the fool's focus is escape and distraction. They don't want to think about the hard stuff. They don't like how it makes them feel and, and they don't like those um, feelings of discomfort. So they escape, they distract themselves, they surf the web, they binge watch, they uh, escape in their minds or sometimes physically escape. They just run, run away, go on lots of vacations or perhaps even get up and physically move. Rather than asking questions like, what am I to learn from this? What do my reactions in this situation, what do my emotions say about where my heart really is, about what I'm really valuing, about what really matters to me? And also asking, and is that what I should be valuing? Is that what should be most important to me? Now, this is not to say that sometimes uh, we, we, we don't need appropriate breaks. Of course we do. We, of course we need appropriate breaks from the heaviness of life. And of course you need to laugh every so often. But you see, the fool folly has a pattern of escapism and distraction, whereas wisdom welcomes sorrow and discomfort. They embrace it. And it's not just embracing sadness and discomfort as an end in itself, just for the sake of embracing it, right? Some of us in our disposition, our, our affect, our personality, we're more like Eeyore in Winnie the Pooh, right? The kind of mopey, uh, um, some of you are, are more like the Eeyore types. And, and right now you're pointing your finger at all the, the Tigger types who are happy all the time and bouncing around. And you're like, see, I told you. Grumpiness, grumpiness is more godly, I told you. But no, Eeyore can be a fool too. Eeyore can be a fool too. It's not welcoming sadness, sorrow for the sake of it, just as an end of itself, in and of itself. It's being willing to face and press into the sadness and the sorrow and the harsh realities of life and then taking the time to self-reflect, to examine your life, asking yourself, what am I to learn about life, about what really matters, asking where your heart really is and where your heart really should be. Again, as our hearts are wrenched and distraught over the tragic shooting of Walter Wallace Jr. And, and as we're disturbed over the ensuing rioting and looting which took place and which his family spoke out against. It's easy to just see that, be disturbed and just kind of let it end there. But instead we should ask questions like, how why do these things keep happening? What are the conditions that lead to such events? 
And in what ways do my actions or inaction contribute? Or what actions could I take to positively contribute, to help turn the tide? Or instead of simply being distraught, or even appalled by those who vote differently than you? Wisdom asks, well, what? what's behind their support? Let me try to understand, what are their hopes? What are their fears? What are their desires? And on the flip side, what are my hopes? What are my fears? What are my desires? And are those desires good? Do they line up with the truth of the gospel? Or have any of these perhaps good desires and intentions morphed into idolatrous desires? Perhaps we're continuing to be frustrated over the way the pandemic has affected so much of life. But again, instead of simply saying, I hope this ends as soon as possible, and that's all you think about, just for the discomfort to go away, we should be asking deeper questions. What are we to learn from all of this? Are we learning about the reality of our limitations as human beings? Are we learning about where we're really looking for security? stability, meaning? Are we learning about what our relationship to the community is as we've lived so much of this life isolated for the past few months? What is my relationship to the community? And is it at where it should be? May we all take the time to dwell in the sorrow, press into the sadness, press into the sorrow in a deep, and reflective way that results in a transformed perspective and therefore a transformed heart and a transformed life. You see, it would be the height of folly. It would be the height of foolishness to experience as much sorrow and hardship as we are and to not learn anything from it to walk away unexamined and unchanged. That would be the height of foolishness. May it not be so. Second, wisdom waits. Wisdom waits. And more specifically, wisdom waits to see. Wisdom waits to see. Verse 8, Better is the end of a thing than its beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Wisdom waits to see how a thing turns out, even when, especially when, something starts small and slow. You see, the fool is proud and presumptuous, and they think they already know how something's going to go. But consider how many instances there are in biblical history where something had a small, unimpressive, slow beginning, but grew, grew and ended up, ended by becoming something far greater than imagined. Most poignantly, most significantly, we think of a baby born in a manger to a poor young couple. That was the beginning. And consider how great the ending is and will be. You see, but the fool, again, in their pride, in their presumption, assume they know already before seeing the end. In their pride and presumption, they already believe they know how it'll end based on what they've seen. Isn't this what we heard at the cross? If he was really the son of God, he wouldn't be up on the cross. Come off the cross if you're really the son of God. The fool always thinks they know best. 
and therefore rarely gives people or plans a chance. They're so good at poo-pooing ideas. It's the attitude that says, Psh, they'll never change. It'll never work. I'm wasting my time. You see, actually, that's a fool's attitude. Wisdom waits to see. Verse 9, be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Continuing in the same vein of thinking, the preacher is saying, the fool in pride and presumption, they trust their own perspective and view on things too much, too much. And so they're quick to anger when plans and when people are not moving at the speed and in the direction they want and they think is best. Everyone else is an idiot. Verse 10, say not why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Again, the fool in pride and presumption overvalue their own perspective. And in this instance, they conclude that past times were better than the present. When that may not be the case. In ignorance, they bemoan the problems of the present and long for the former days, the good old days, failing to see maybe it was never as good as they thought it was. They failed to consider that perhaps the less troubled past was only less troubled for them. That they had the privilege of being sheltered from the problems that were always there. They, perhaps being stuck in ignorance and being myopic, but believing that their perspective is the only one and the right one. The fool says, I see clearly, I'm sure I'm right, I'm sure my perspective is right, whereas wisdom, out of a heart of humility, waits to see. Could it be? Maybe my view, maybe my opinion, maybe my perspective isn't infallible after all. And isn't this posture sorely needed today? Isn't this so necessary today? You see, most folks are stuck in their own echo chambers. Social media has just made this worse. We only follow and listen to people who already think like us. And when we see, and our, our, our feed on social media only affirms our view and our way of thinking because we only follow people like us. And therefore, when a, a, a contrary view, an opposing view pops up, we just get angry. We, we are so quick to attack, to get triggered and to attack. But wisdom, wisdom slows down to consider, perhaps my perspective could be wrong on this. Perhaps my perspective is limited and I'm only seeing in part. Or perhaps your perspective is right. But even if it is, foolishness, foolishness is, if you're right, when someone begins to push back, someone begins to question you, you simply beat them over the head with argumentation. And you might win the argument, but you will lose the friendship. You will lose the relationship. That's foolishness. Wisdom waits and sees. Hey, this person may not see what I see right now. They might not see this angle or this perspective, but Maybe the end can be better than the beginning. Let's see the end of things and not just assume right now that this person's always going to be where they are now. Maybe the end is and will be better than the beginning, says wisdom. 
and therefore you listen with patience, with love, and with humility you engage. Lastly, wisdom watches over verses 11 and 12. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. You see, money is fleeting. However, even though it's fleeting, it does offer a measure of protection and security in this life. In an economic downturn, the person with a big savings account is much better off, practically speaking, than the person who is living paycheck to paycheck. Likewise, the preacher saying, living according to wisdom serves to protect you in this life. It secures you, it saves you from trouble in this already troubled life. And this is why Solomon writes in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, 13 to 18, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than gain from silver, and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. Chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you. Love her and she will guard you. This is true. And this is encouraging because you see this wisdom is not some mysterious, unattainable, esoteric thing. This wisdom is right here for us. It's available to us in the Word of God, and it grows out of a relationship with God, walking in a healthy fear of God. So then, every believer should be incredibly wise. Every believer should be living these lives of incredible wisdom, right? Well, we wish. But you and I know that we are so often prone to walk in foolishness rather than wisdom. Our hearts are wayward. And rather than choosing the path of wisdom, we choose the path of folly. We bring trouble on ourselves and we bring trouble on others because of our foolishness, our foolish words, our foolish actions, our foolish decisions and desires. Furthermore, Remember, this is still Ecclesiastes, a book that's very honest about how life isn't all neat and tidy, and it doesn't often work like we think it should. Throughout the rest of chapter 7 into chapters 8 and 9, the preacher makes the point that even if you live by wisdom, even if you live this incredibly wise life, it doesn't necessarily guarantee that everything's going to go well. Horrible tragedies still happen to very wise people. And at the end of chapter 9, he describes the story of a poor wise man whose city was under siege by a mightier kingdom. And this poor wise man saved his city from this greater kingdom, I guess by his counsel. He saved his city, yet instead of being a hero for it, he was despised, forgotten, and ignored. That's the story he tells. So, our ultimate hope and comfort must not be in ourselves and in our ability to live wisely. Because there are many times we're going to act a fool. And our hope and comfort must not even be in living wisely in and of itself. Because as much as living according to wisdom will guard and watch over you and save you so much trouble, it cannot insulate you from all trouble. Verses 13 and 14 describe how nothing is ultimately in our control. And yes, at times in life, even the wise and the righteous suffer greatly. Our ultimate hope. 
our ultimate comfort is not in our ability to live wisely or in living wisely in and of itself. Our ultimate hope, our ultimate comfort is in wisdom personified literally. You see, John chapter 1 describes how the Logos, the Word, the wisdom of God in the beginning, in the beginning, the Word was with God. He was God. And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God who took on flesh. And He came into this world to rescue a world full of fools who made a mess of our lives and a mess of His world, the world that He created. Jesus is the ultimate poor wise man who saved His city even though His city despised and ignored and rejected Him. Jesus died a fool's death upon a cross Even though he was the wisest person who ever walked the face of this earth, he was literally wisdom embodied, and yet he died like a fool upon the cross, and he did this to take the punishment we deserved for our foolish living, because we foolishly lived as though we didn't need God. We foolishly lived as though our wisdom was enough, as if we knew best, when that certainly was not the case. And so Jesus took our place, He took our punishment, and for all who trust in Him, He guarantees you a place in His eternal city, where there is no more pain, no more sorrow, no more shootings, no more looting, no more racism, no more division, but only perfect love, perfect justice, perfect peace forevermore. And until that day comes, Jesus is transforming us by His power that you and I might walk in wisdom more and more and more. And even though walking in wisdom will save you much trouble, it will save you so much unnecessary trouble, it still will not guard you from all trouble. But even still, our hearts find tremendous hope and comfort in knowing that Jesus Christ, the very wisdom of God, He watches over us. He walks with us. And He guarantees, through His death and resurrection, He has guaranteed the end will be better than the beginning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You For indeed, you are the Word, the Wisdom, who became flesh. And you made your dwelling among us. You saved us from our folly. Lord, we see the effects of folly, foolishness, rebellion throughout our world. We see the incredibly damaging consequences of hearts turned away from you. And so, Lord, as our heart's desire is to see things change, Would you start with us? Would you turn our hearts fully to you? Turn us away more and more from our foolishness. Turn us more and more away from trusting in our own wisdom and worldly wisdom. And turn us more and more to the wisdom that is found in you, our wisdom. Christ, you have become for us wisdom. And so we look to you and ask that you would enable and empower us and transform us to walk in your wisdom more and more, not only for our own benefit and flourishing, but that it would result in the flourishing of the world around us as we walk in wisdom in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close in this final song.
now receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was the wisdom of God that took on flesh for our sake, the love of God the Father, who is sovereign and full of wisdom, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and with you as you continue to walk in His wisdom, the wisdom of Christ, the wisdom of the gospel, which the world may call foolish, but truly is the wisdom of God and the power unto salvation. Amen. Go in his wisdom, friends.